there's always going to be resistance. There's always going to be spiritual warfare. There's always going to be attacked. And we need to be ready to stand together as we follow Christ. That's kind of what this message is about. We're here in Romans chapter 12. We'll be through verses 3 through 8. But I want to spend the next 10, 15 minutes on what we covered in verse 1 through 2. I didn't have time to cover everything. And something that's vitally important for us to understand is when the Bible says it is our reasonable service, of course, as we studied because of what we learned through chapter 1 through 11. It will not be reasonable for us to present our body a living sacrifice, to give everything to God, unless we have the doctrine, the word of God, through Romans 1 through 11. It won't be. That's why it's vitally important. That's why it's vitally important for churches to teach the word of God expositionally. Because if we didn't grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ through Romans 1, 11, and the rest of Scripture, it will be completely crazy to us to present our bodies as living sacrifices. So once we've grown in that knowledge, but the Bible is not just saying, and this is very important, follow me for the next 15 minutes, then after that you can go to sleep. The, when it says it's our reasonable service, when I first started preaching, and I'm shocked, now full time for 15 years, and preaching for 17 years now, I used to read 10 to 20 commentaries on the subject I was preaching on, the scripture I was preaching on every time. Nowadays, I, look to, I still read some commentaries, but nowadays I'll look up the Hebrew and the Greek. And when the Bible is saying that it is our reasonable service to present our bodies a living sacrifice, there's something that most people miss, by the way, that we could have missed if I would have gone on without saying it today. Now, of course, it's saying it is what we're supposed to do. It is what we ought to do. It is what is right to do, to be a bond slave, that our life doesn't belong to us, our minds, our feet, our hands, our legs, our phones, our teeth, nothing about our life belongs to us, it all belongs to God. But it's saying something even deeper than that. When it says it's our reasonable service, it is actually saying this is our reason for living itself. It is the very reason for which we exist to present our entire lives to the God who created us. When Pastor Ken was here teaching last week on the, or a couple weeks ago at the Love the Bible conference, he had mentioned something that he had actually not mentioned before, and you guys notice he taught the same thing, right? Well, it always, it's getting better every year. Not that it was bad before, but he added something. Something he said fascinated me. He said, when God was judging Adam and Eve, and he told Eve that her sorrows will be multiplied on earth, it wasn't a God who was so angry that in his anger he was judging Eve and saying, I can't believe you've done this. How dare you? I will punish you for this. That's not what God was doing. God could not prevent what had happened to them after it had happened. Now, certainly God had the power to grab them up, take the tree out of the garden, never allow them to eat, but that wouldn't have been loving. And even that he really couldn't do because he has to give us a choice. But he wasn't judging her in a way where it could have been prevented he was explaining to her the consequences of her sin. In other words, it was unpreventable even by God for them to fall into sin and to be in the condition that they were in because of that. Let me put it this way. Are there things God cannot do? Is that a trick question? Are there things God cannot do? Yes. Can God lie? No. Can God murder? No, he can kill, but he won't murder. It's the difference. Can God 
be unloving, unjust. No, God is perfectly holy and he cannot commit sin. He told them, in the day that you eat this, you will surely die. You will die. This is the consequences. And it wasn't some wrathful, uncontrollably angry God who said, you will be punished. I know I could prevent this punishment, but I won't because of his anger. No, he is saying to Adam and Eve, this is the condition you're in. I can't stop it. You ate of the tree. I told you not to. I love you. Now, I want you to know, though I can't stop the condition you're in and all your children will be born into sin, I have a plan. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to save you. I'm going to reconcile you. I love you. That's the heart of God. God doesn't want us to suffer, but unfortunately, because we don't obey him, we do suffer. Now, when, when it says here in Romans that it's our reasonable service, it's our reason for existence to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's how we need to see this. And when we don't present our bodies a living sacrifice to God, which is the reason for our existence, we will suffer. We will have the unnecessary consequences of sin. That is what's going on here. We were created to worship God and to make him known throughout the earth. And when we don't do that, we are forfeiting the very meaning and purpose of our lives. Let me continue on with this fundamental principle. In Matthew chapter five, and we did this some months ago, I taught on salt and light. Jesus Christ described in 12 verses what are the Beatitudes, excuse me, I got a cough. What are the Beatitudes? So those who were described from verses one through 12 in Matthew chapter five, the poor in spirit, and because they're poor in spirit, they seek after righteousness, uh, they mourn, they're merciful, those people who are described in 1 through 12, they are the salt of the earth, they are the light of the world. Now, don't think for a second the salt and the light are people who are just being nice. That's not what salt and light is. Now, we're supposed to be kind and stuff. That's a different subject. The salt and the light are people being dis described there in Matthew 12 as conduits of truth. They receive truth, because of God's word, and they speak truth. They're a conduit. It's flowing through them all the time, flowing into them and flowing out of them, flowing into them and flowing out of them. Can you imagine um, that when it says it's our reasonable service, it's actually saying it's our reason for existence to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, God created us to be his worshipers, to be his bond slaves, to be his servants, to be those who proclaim him. So salt and light are people who are conduits of truth. Are you following me? Are you with me? Because this is very good. This is important. What happens when the salt loses its tastiness? That word tastiness in Matthew 5, it's the root word of the word foolish. It's described in Romans 1, that word foolish. And then it's in 1 Corinthians 1, foolishness of this world. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, it says in 1 Corinthians 1. When we are not conduits of truth, it's flowing into us and coming out of us. It's flowing into us. We are foolish. And what happens to us? We are trampled under the foot of men, the Bible says. What does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean in Matthew 5 that we're losing our salvation. It means when we are not salt and light, which is conduits of truth, we receive the word of God and we speak the word of God. When we don't do that, the world tramples us and we lose that very meaning for which we are living. We have no purpose. In other words, you're empty inside. You're empty. 
Now, there is a false belief in understanding what it means to be fulfilled in Christianity. People have the assumption that getting born again immediately gives you joy, meaning, fulfillment, and purpose. We've heard pastors say this, haven't we? Get born again and you'll have meaning. Get born again and you'll have purpose. Get born again and you'll have peace, which surpasses what? All understanding, you know it. Do you know what the verses say before that in Philippians? Philippians 4? In other words, Christians don't have automatic peace that passes understanding, surpasses. It's when we as Christians are praying that when you pray that the God of peace will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. So you as a Christian who are not praying will not have the peace you need when you're going through troubled times. It doesn't automatically come. You have to be in prayer to get the peace that surpasses all understanding. This is what I'm saying. As a Christian, born-again believer on their way to heaven, it is possible to be completely empty inside. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's in there. You're just keeping him really quiet. There's no communion. There may be a consecration without communion, which Samson had. And when we are not the salt and light, the conduits of truth... We are forfeiting the very reason for which we exist and we will have unnecessary emptiness in our lives. To be a doctor, a Christian doctor without proclaiming truth, you're empty. Your career even becomes meaningless. And any, you, any profession you have, business owner, whatever, it's, whatever you have, proclaiming Jesus Christ and the truth of his word is the lifeblood of every Christian. And here when it says it's our reasonable service, it's our reason for existence. And when you're not a conduit of truth, proclaiming, you're gonna have emptiness in your life. You're gonna have an unnecessary uh, anxiety. You'll be trampled under the foot of men. You ever been in a situation where somebody was saying something that wasn't true and the Holy Spirit is screaming in you saying, hey, s speak the truth, say something. And you just didn't want to be bothered by it and you walk away. Do you know what happens on the inside? You're trampled by the foot of men. There's emptiness. There's a lack of meaning and purpose. It hurts you because the Holy Spirit was screaming out and you're like, no, not today. You know, during the conference, the Love the Bible conference, I can't believe how many people came that two and a half days. We think maybe as many as 3,000 people walked through the church. I was walking right there and a guy came up and he started talking and the more he talked, I started to sense uh, this guy's a little off. And he was talking about how much he loved the Lord, but things he was saying, I'm like, uh. Then he finally came out and said it. I'm a follower of Kenneth Hagin. He had never been to our church before, obviously because you don't come say that to Pastor Josh. No, you can, and I'll correct you. I'll do it lovingly, but I have to say something. But you know what happened? I was tempted by just walking away and not being bothered by it. It's like, oh gosh, how many times have I said this? Eh, all right, see ya, I'm going to get lunch. And it was during lunchtime, you know? But the Holy Spirit, no. Do you love the man? Yes, I love him. Tell him the truth. Kenneth Hagin is a false prophet. <laughs> and I'm sorry you have wasted 10 years of your life following him, but it's time to come to the real truth because he's been destroying you. He's been presenting God as a bad God, a God who loves some more than others, and he loves all of us the same. So I told him, and he's like, really? <laughs> and you know, Kenyans, they're funny. He's, wow. <laughs> And he was nice, and he, we took down contacts. I hope he contacts me. We can continue talking about this. Do you know what would have happened to me if I didn't say it? I would have been trampled by the field of men. Can you believe I was at that conference? And uh, actually, it wasn't that one. It was the missions conference I was preaching at. The same church, though. And a guy come up. Two Kenyan pastors. They heard me preach. like, oh, yes. They started 
you know, f- flattering me, which I, I don't try to pay attention to anymore. I, I appreciate encouragement, by the way. That wasn't to say don't come up and encourage me. I need it. I need it. No, I'm done. He, he come up and guess what? They're followers of Prophet war. We're in Philadelphia. I thought I got away from that man. He gives Beard a bad name. I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. Prophet Awar? He's a, he's a false prophet. He says he's the angel of Revelation chapter 3. This is crazy. This is crazy, guys. You know what would happen? Trampled under the foot of men. If I don't speak that. Guys, we forfeit being salt and light when we do not preach on the exclusivity of Christ. We forfeit being salt and light when we do not preach on God's everlasting covenant with the nation of Israel. You know why? Because if God can break his covenant with Israel, he can break his covenant with you and me, can't he? Ladies, if a guy comes up to you and says, hey, I want you to know, I will never leave you, forsake you. Um, My background is I've had 10 wives, but it will never happen again. Are you going to believe him? No. No. And you think we ought to believe God if he's forsaken his everlasting covenant with Israel? He has not because he will never forsake those whom he's made an everlasting covenant with. That's why it's important to talk about these issues. And they're being talked about throughout the world. And we're going to allow the world to have a louder voice than those who know the truth. And when we do that, we're trampled under the foot of men. And by the way we lose the very reason for which we exist, and that is to receive the revelation of God and proclaim it to the world. So it's not just, yes, it's our reasonable service, it is. It's the reason for our existence. And when we don't do it, we get empty on the inside. Damaged. Damaged. God's saying, I I want you to go share the truth. And if you don't, It's not that I'm punishing you, but you're going to have consequences. Now, I'm not saying you got to be an evangelist. All I'm saying is speak up sometimes at work when people have a pro-Hamas flag. You go take a pro-Israel flag and put it right next to theirs on the wall. You don't even have to say nothing. They'll hate you for it. So we move on. Paul says, for I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them in prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhorting, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This is incredible. There's a, there's a shift happening with a very important connection. The shift is, he has spent 11 chapters talking about the problems with religion's view of who man is and who God is. They think man is good enough to earn salvation. They don't think Jesus Christ is God, the Savior of the world. So Paul corrects it. The pride. This is the connection. Because now he's shifting to not talk about Judaism. He's now talking about the church. Born again believers, those who are in local churches, those, are who, th- those who make up the body of Christ. But there's a connection and, it, and it's so interesting. It's you have exalted yourself. You are a prideful person to think you could ascend and grab a hold of heaven rather than recognizing the person who descended from heaven and came to earth. You, this is pride. This is the pride of man. And so, those of us who've gotten born again, who now make up the body of Christ, we come into the church, we humbled ourselves for a, for a second, 
And we said, okay, Christ, we need you. We love you. Please save us. We all uh, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one good, no, not one. And even while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. We recognize it. We love him. We want to be born again. They get born again. We get born again. What's carried over? Pride. Pride. It's like, okay, here we are. We couldn't save ourselves. Now what? Okay, I'm going to give you different gifts. Some prophecy and teaching and exhorting and mercy and giving. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the different gifts. And now we categorize them as greater than others. Isn't it remarkable how prideful we can become in a Nairobi second? If you don't know what that means, it just means time goes by a little faster in Nairobi. It's, I, I got born again. I was a heroin addict. I, I was homeless, basically. I came into a program because I got up and prayed at 4 a.m. and read my Bible every time. Guess what? I thought I was better than others. I went from heroin addict to Pharisee in four months. That's incredible. After four months, I was, you know, it's like, the Lord told me, he's like, you're a Pharisee. I'm like, huh? Yeah, you're a Pharisee. Really? Whoa, God, this is incredible. What's going on? That's what's happening in the church. It's destroying people. And we're talking about churches that speak good doctrine. I'm not talking about the Kenneth Copeland churches. I'm talking about churches like ours that judge each other as one gift being better than another. And Paul goes on and what he's saying is, how is it that you're boasting over the gifts? Isn't a gift something that you didn't have before that was given to you, something you couldn't have attained to? And guys, we do this. And Paul's reminding, he says, everything you have is from God. Why are you bragging about yourself? In other words, pride is an illusion. If you're prideful, you're walking in a fantasy that isn't real. That's why it means to be sober-minded. As it says, to think soberly. That's what we read. Humility is to acknowledge the very state of reality. The state of who you are. You didn't earn, you guys, you, you didn't deserve anything that God gave you. Can you. And we do this, don't we? Can you imagine I buy a Land Cruiser Prado, I drive it in? Brand new 2024 Land Cruiser Prado. And, 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 and I take you, you out to it. I said, this is yours. This is what's happening with the church, by the way. At first, we're humble. We're like, oh my gosh, you bought me a Land Cruiser Prado. I even like the color. I like the seats. Uh, this is incredible. I could have never bought this. Thank you so much. And there's a humility for a second. Thank you so much. Oh, you get in, you drive to town. <laughs> Laid back. Yo, 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 yo. And you start bragging about your Land Cruiser Prado that you couldn't buy. Look at me. Look how cool I am. Girl, you want to ride? Yeah, you, 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 to think soberly. Guys, other, you got to go with this stream of thought. Pride is an illusion. It's not real. Because nobody has anything to be proud of. It was all a gift of God. The very oxygen that we breathe, God created. He gave it to us. We didn't create oxygen. We would die without it. Have you guys ever seen drunk people try to dance? Have you ever been that drunk person dancing? Raise your hand. No, I don't. I have. Guys, I was drunk for 10 years of my life. And I thought I was an amazing dancer when I was drunk. One night I went over to TMT to party. No, I'm kidding. To, to tell them to turn their music down. It was so loud. We were having an event. And I walked in and all these people were drunk and they were dancing. And I walked in and I saw them. I thought, that's what I look like when I was drunk. And they think they're so good at dancing, don't they? Like, mm -hmm. And in their minds, they're like, I am awesome. And this girl's going to want me because of these moves. They think they're Michael Jackson when they're dancing. You know, can't stop till I get enough. And they're not. And fighting, fighting. Guys think they're amazing fighters when they're drunk. Why, I'll beat you up. I cannot tell you how many drunk men have gone down 
when they fight sober people. It is not sober for us to be prideful. It is a fantasy in our minds. It's something that isn't real. We have no reason to boast. Paul says it is a gift of God. Everything we have, there's no reason to brag. So when we're prideful, it's like we're drunk in our minds. Drunk. And when we're humble, we're sober. He says, each one has been given a measure of faith. Now, when I first read this, I was a little discouraged because I didn't know what it meant. This was years ago. I thought it meant that God gives big faith to some and little faith to others. Isn't that discouraging? Anytime it's bad news, you know it's not good doctrine, just so you know. That should be a litmus test. If it's bad news to my spirit, it's bad doctrine. What, it, what it's saying is God gives a measure of faith in the sense that he gives different gifts. God wants you to have big faith. God has given you access to have as big a faith as the Apostle Paul. He will not keep you from big faith. That's not what it's saying. It's saying he's given different gifts of faith to different people. He's not saying he's going to give little faith to some and big faith. You know what? That's what the false teachers want you to believe. The pastors, the bishops and apostles and prophets. Go to them. They have big faith. They're connected with God. God, he reveals more to them. He loves them more. That's nonsense. God loves you just as much as he loves any pastor in this world. And quite frankly, he's disappointed with the pastors more than he's disappointed with you. If God came now, Jesus Christ came, he wouldn't clear the temple, he'd clear the pulpit. And he would stand in there and he would give you the good news of how much he loves us and how much he wants to bless us. And then he goes through this list of prophecy, let us give in proportion to our faith. What that means is prophecy must be done according to good doctrine. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. It must be given. When we proclaim, and this kind of prophecy, by the way, it's not foretelling the future, it is forthtelling the word of God. It is those who are preachers, those who are proclaimers. If you don't follow the word, this will happen to you. Those kind of people. I have this gift. I can go to people and say, hey, if you go down this road, this is what's going to happen. And, and, and it's to be done with good doctrine. That's what it's saying. That we need to proclaim accurate doctrine. In ministry, in ministering, that is where we get the Greek word uh, deacon, diakonai in the Greek. Um, it simply means to serve, to administer service to people. You're, you're, you're cleaning, you're cooking, you're helping, you're mopping, you're cleaning the chairs, you're serving at church, you're serving at home. Those who have that extra gift of service. It's a wonderful thing. And isn't it interesting, we have a caste system, like the, the janitor of the church is not as good as the pastor. I like to see the pastor sweep and mop the floors for 10 years. I bet he can't do it. Most pastors. So he who ministers, let him minister. He who teaches, that is um, the, the, the Greek word to instruct with doctrine. Those who teach the word of God, they're making it clear. He who exhorts, perikaleo, that's to call near. The difference between teaching and exhorting is those who exhort are encouraging people to apply the doctrine they've learned. If we only have teachers in the church, people will get real fat, uh, spiritually speaking. And if they don't exercise their faith through the exhortation of preaching, they will not go and do what they're supposed to do, which is to exercise that faith and not be spiritually lazy. He who gives, um, that means to share, to, to, to do it uh, with liberty, to do it generously. Some people, though we're all called, I believe, to give our tithes and offerings to our local church, there are those who have extra and who have that gift of giving. 
They just give to the church. They give to people. They just give of their resources. Do it with cheerfulness. Don't go remind somebody that you bought, gave them 500 shillings a year ago. Don't, hey, you remember I, a year ago I gave you 500 shillings? They're like, yes. Wasn't that nice of me? Don't do that. Oddly enough, I had somebody do that last week um, in, in America. He who leads. The, the, the word lead here, it's a leader. It's, uh, the Greek word is A-G-O, a go. It means to carry somebody. To carry someone. It says to do it with all diligence. One of the great problems in our world, guys, is when people finally attain what they perceive to be um, a position of power and authority, they get lazy and have everybody else work harder for them. I've seen it in business owners. I've seen it in pastors especially. Oh, I'm the head pastor. Nobody can dictate my schedule. I don't have a boss. They're going to work. You know, I'm at home studying. No, you're not. You're at home watching TV. Pastor, get to work. Let the people see that you're going to lead by uh, example diligently with hard work. Work for the Lord. Laziness in leadership is one of the biggest problems of leaders today. We ought not to be lazy. And then it says mercy with cheerfulness. To show compassion. One word for here in mercy is to empathize. Now the subject is the church has grown in pride not soon after their salvation, judging and classifying some gifts as above the other. Let me give you an illustration of this to help you. Imagine if I asked somebody in the back of the room, bring me a glass of water. And they grabbed the glass of water, and in front of all of us right now, they came up and they tripped right here, and they fell down, and they broke the glass. You guys know when glass breaks, it makes a loud sound, it shatters, there's no water, the glass is broken we would see all of these gifts in motion. The person who has that gift of prophecy, they'd be like, hey, if you do that again in the future, maybe you'll slice your throat and die, so be careful. We have the person with ministry, that gift of service, they're gonna do what? They're gonna grab a mop, they're gonna grab a broom, and they're gonna come and start cleaning up. The person who's teaching, these people always get judged. I know this. They're like, hey, you walked incorrectly. You were doing this when you walked. If you walk with better form like this and you hold the glass with two hands and you walk slower, you're not going to drop and break the glass. Afterwards, when this is done, I'll show you how to walk with proper form. That's what the teacher's going to do. That can be annoying, huh? The exhorter, he's the encourager. He's like... Next time you carry water in front of the whole church, you're going to do it. You're not going to break it. It's going to be successful. Don't give up. Try again. That's the exhorter. You're going to have the person who's giving. What are they going to do? They're going to go buy a new glass. Like, hey, here's 500 shillings. Go to Nivis. Let's buy a new glass. We need a new glass. The church needs a new glass. We're going to buy it. The person who leads, maybe that person hurt their leg or something, they're going to come up, they're going to put that person on their shoulder, they're going to carry them out, they're going to help them. That person who has mercy, that word empathy, and a lot of you ladies have this, they're, they're going to feel the pain of the humiliation of falling down in front of everyone. They're going to go, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed with you. This is so hard. I, oh. They're going to cry with that person. They're like, oh gosh. I have a secretary in the States that works for GCM. She's the most empathetic woman I've ever known. And it's, her existence has to be miserable. She feels everything. If somebody's mom's died, it's like her mom died. You should see this woman. She's like, oh my gosh, our mom died. This is terrible. She has that gift of mercy, of empathy. And this is the problem. This is the problem Paul's talking about. When that person who has that gift of mercy is mad at the person who has the gift of, or of teaching and they start judging. 
When that person who has the gift of teaching starts judging the person of mercy, not, now's not a time for mercy. We need to correct this situation. And the people with the different gifts, they start judging one another as their gift being better than the other. And guys, it, Paul addresses it now and it's been going on for 2,000 years in churches. One gift is above another. It's terrible. And unfortunately, the gifts that are exalted are the gifts that people see with their eyes. Preacher and the worship team. Let's see. Can you imagine a toe screaming out at the rest of their body? I am tired of this dark, stinky place. I get no recognition. Nobody brings me out in the open. You know what? I'm the one. I'm the one who gets this body wherever it needs to go. Without me, you wouldn't get to the grocery store. Without me, you wouldn't walk home. Can you imagine the toe saying that? How absurd. And we do this all the time. One day I'll ascend. And we, we put these things, and, and this is not how God thinks. This is not how God views the different gifts. And our gifts will be rewarded in heaven, but the problem we have is to exalt one gift above another or judge somebody because we don't have the same gift. I, I'm not trying to get pity, but guys, people judge me all the time for having the gift of preaching, ex exhorting, and teaching. All the time. It's like, you could have been more merciful. You could have, you didn't have to say that. Well, yes. I remember when Chuck Smith's memorial service, there was like 16,000 people in the stadium. And all these guys came who were his disciples, all these people, you even know some of their names, and they were each given like five minutes to say something about Pastor Chuck Smith because there were so many of them. They had limited time. And one of them got up there and he said something I didn't like. He said, our God is not a sinner's in the hands of an angry God kind of God. Well, if you don't know what he's saying, he's referencing Jonathan Edwards' sermon Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is one of the greatest sermons that America has ever heard. And thousands of people got saved that day that he preached it. In other words, this guy who said that, who was a Calvary Chapel pastor, is judging because he is more of an encourager teacher, somebody who is a prophesier uh, and, and, and proclaimer. Oh, we don't speak this way. We don't talk about how God's angry. God's not angry. Let me tell you something. God is angry with people who refuse to receive Jesus Christ. And he loves them so much that he wants them to be born again, and if they don't, he will send them to hell. And we gotta be careful that we're not, that's exactly what he's do, doing, this guy I'm talking about was violating the scripture. Just two Sundays ago was Mother's Day. It was Mother's Day. And on Mother's Day, Pastor Ken Graves was here teaching us and he had somebody filling in for him at his church who is a guest speaker who has a ministry to speak out against abortion in America. Well, somebody who has that gift of mercy started judging Pastor Ken on one of the group chats that he was on. Oh, I'm feeling for the women who've had abortion on Mother's Day. Would we really have somebody like that here? I feel so terrible for those women. And he's like, wait a minute. Just because somebody's had an abortion, that means we can proclaim the truth that it's wrong to have an abortion? He's judging. He was actually criticizing his own pastor about his choice of guest speakers. Let me tell you something. Ladies, if you have an abortion, God loves you. He'll forgive you. He will. Doesn't mean it wasn't a sin, just like the rest of our sins. Doesn't mean we don't have the right to speak out against it. Guys, the church is tearing itself apart by judging one another's gifts. That's what's happening. 
We gotta be gracious to one another. We may not understand because we have a different gift. But the gifts, all of these gifts need to be in operation at the church. Or people who need comfort won't be comforted. People who need correction won't be corrected. People need who encouragement won't be encouraged. People who need help won't be given to. We need to be careful. We need to exercise our gifts without judging one another. And by the way, we need to have the gifts being exercised without exalting one over another. It's, it's a shame the way we view this. All oh, the pastor's the best. There are plenty better people in this church than me. I just have that gift of preaching and teaching. I'm no better than the the person who's cleaning the church on Saturdays. I'm no better than the children's ministry workers. They're no better than me. We're no better than the worship team. They're no better than us. We need all of this stuff going on, not just at our church, but in our homes. What if I were to criticize my wife every time she showed mercy to the children when they got hurt or when they were being uh, naughty? It compliments both the man and the woman. Children need this. In other words, we have become so judgmental in our pride. So judgmental. We need to stop judging each other. We need to stop exalting people over another. The only person in this church that needs to be exalted who is worthy of worship is Jesus Christ. That's not to say you're not to respect. I I, I don't like disrespect. But Jesus Christ is the one to be exalted. After the second service, and the worship team can come up. After the second service, um, a woman came up. She's been here a couple times. Maybe she said it was her first time. I don't quite remember. And she came up and she said, you know, Calvary Chapel is a place of refuge. She says, so many of us have been hurt by so many churches where certain people are just thrown down as nobodies and other people are lifted up as somebodies. So so much legalism, so much heartache, so much judgment, so much comparison. And may our church not be that way. May our church respect admire and cherish the different gifts that God has given every one of us, not exalting one over the other, for we are the body of Christ and each member of the body has a very important role to play. Amen? We're gonna pray. We have baptism. We only have a couple of people signed up, but guys, if you've never been baptized, it's okay if you didn't sign up, just come be baptized. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. Lord, your word is so comforting to us. It's it's such a blessing. (laughs) It, It makes everything so good. It settles our hearts. It comforts our minds. It always is the good news. And I pray, Lord, that if there is judgment amongst us at our church, that we wouldn't exalt one gift over another, knowing that the body of Christ needs all of our gifts. Both in this place, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our families. That we would admire the different gifts that God has given different people. I pray you'd give us the wisdom to apply this. I pray you'd give us the humility to repent. And I pray you'd give us the power to see things clearly moving forward in the future. I pray your blessings upon that. Holy Spirit, fill us and come upon us, giving us clarity. Help us not to be the Pharisees. Help us not to be those people that exalt man over other men while ignoring Jesus Christ, the only one that should be exalted. Please help us. 
And we ask, Lord, that you also bless the offering that we give now. Receive it as an act of worship because we love you. Grant us wisdom through the administration of these gifts that we may proclaim your gospel and expand your kingdom in this city and in this nation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.